a reading from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8 and 15. Daniel's in the Old Testament. <laughs> In the first year of Babylon's King Belshazzar, Daniel had a dream, a vision in his head as he lay on his bed. He wrote the dream down. Here is the beginning of the account. I am Daniel. In the vision I had during the night, I saw the four winds of heaven churning the great sea. Four giant beasts emerged from the sea, each different from the others. The first was like a lion with eagle's wings. I observed it until its wings were pulled off and it was lifted up from the ground. It was then set on two feet like a human being and it received a human mind. Then I saw another beast, the second one, like a bear. It was raised on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, devour much flesh. I kept watching, and suddenly there was another beast, this one like a leopard. On its back, it had four wings, like bird wings. This beast had four heads, and authority was given to it. After this, I continued to watch the night vision. I saw a fourth beast, terrifying and hideous, with extraordinary power and massive iron teeth, as it ate and crushed, its feet smashed, whatever was left over. It was different from all the other beasts before it, and it had ten horns. I was staring at these horns when suddenly another small horn came up between them, and three of the earlier horns were ripped out to make room for it. On this new horn were eyes, like human eyes, and a mouth that bragged and bragged. Now this caused me, Daniel, to worry. My visions disturbed me greatly. Has anyone been following the news? <laughs> um, I. I asked that question just because I feel like that's just a really, really easy go-to for a preacher anytime you want to establish like a baseline that we're living in a fallen world. Like it's just, you know, we'll just point at whatever headlines are going on right now and it's pretty evident. And yeah, it's a cheap trick, but it's very true. <laughs> um, without even having to go into the headlines, like going back over in our liturgy this morning, that lament that we went through, all of those different things that we're crying out about. Um, thinking even broader terms, like we know there's war going on in Ukraine, but there's also a war in Myanmar, Yemen, and Ethiopia. And that's, those are just the ones that have like greater than 10,000 casualties in the last year. Actually, we could count, if you wanted to add the, the drug wars in Mexico, that also is in the 10,000 body count. If we want to go just down to 1,000 and greater, there's another 18 conflicts around this world that are going on right now. There's climate change. <laughs> things, are, things are getting hotter and hotter, and we're just now starting to see really ramifications of this, and we're really not sure how that's going to continue to play out over time, and we're really not sure if we can do anything about it, and we're really not sure if anyone's going to actually do anything about it. Um, a little bit closer to home, we have mass shootings, um, just kind of regularly in this country. The Onion, uh, my favorite satire site, runs this headline every time. There's nothing we can do about this, says only country where this happens all the time. <laughs> Getting ready for school, like that's part of the conversation with the principal and the teachers and the PTA meetings. It's like, what are we doing about safety? This is our protocol for locking the doors. This is how we know who's allowed in the building and who's not allowed in the building. We need to make sure we have the building secured and safe and, and everything in place. And you're just like, this is just what we do now. Um, and then that doesn't even get to the rest of these systemic injustices that are all throughout our society. Um, just to pick a couple off the top of my head, 
uh, there's a housing crisis, as in there's a lack of affordable housing. And any time I read about a, a development that's gonna build some new affordable housing, the people that live in the area fight it. They don't want it to be there because of the crime or traffic or whatever. And our society has just open hostility towards the unhoused. I mean, how many raids are we gonna do on tent cities? How many fences do we need to build around overpasses to try to make the least habitable spots of our areas like inaccessible? I could go on, we could talk about healthcare, we could talk about education, I could rant about urbanist city design for way longer than anyone wants to listen to me. The point that I'm driving at is that there are so many huge problems in this world that it can just feel completely overwhelming. And when I think about all of it, or even when I just think about one of these things, I feel powerless. Like, I, I don't even know that there's anything meaningful that I could possibly do that would even matter. And I wonder about this. Like, as a follower of Christ, what am I supposed to be doing? Should, should, I, should I be in, in part of every protest, making signs and screaming and that? Do I need to be, like, calling legislators and advocating and lobbying for laws to change? Do I need to get more militant? Do we need to really join the resistance and fight back and change things? Or, or do I need to just withdraw from all of that, from the fallen world? And do I pray for, for Christ to come or pray for something? I don't know. When I think about all of this stuff, I kind of feel like Daniel looking at all those beasts. It causes me to worry and it disturbs me greatly. Today, we're going to start a series on the book of Daniel. And I think, you're going to have to go back and look at our sermon history. I think we have a bias towards preaching from the New Testament, because I feel like the assumption was that whatever the text is that we're talking from is the New Testament reading, and whatever the other one is, the, is the Old Testament. <laughs> Maybe that's unfounded. I don't know. I haven't, done the, I haven't looked yet. Uh, I did go back and look to see, have we talked about Daniel before? And I actually did do a lesson on Daniel a couple of years ago in the middle of another series. Um, and uh, we just talked about it just, just a little bit there, talking about um, telling how we tell our own story of God. I did the thing with the fractals, and we talked about retelling the story and trying to make sense of, of an unjust world. Um, and there was... I said in that message, I was like, there's a lot about Daniel. Daniel is such a fascinating book, and I could really just talk on and on and on and on and on and about all the weird, cool things in this book. But I had a point to get to then, so I didn't. We've got 14 weeks. <laughs> we got a lot of practice for a while. We're going, we're going to go all into this. <laughs> Daniel is a weird, cool book. Um, I remember the first time that I really studied it, I was in college, and just all of, the, all of the weird facts about it just kind of hit my nerd theological brain. Um, first of all, there's like, you could divide it in half. There's two distinct parts to this book. The first half is a collection of stories. These are stories that you actually probably know. Um, you get Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bednego in the fiery furnace. You've got the writing on the wall, Daniel interpreting visions, right? The second half of the book is a collection of visions. A lot of beasts, um, a lot of angels and warfare and things that continue to disturb Daniel greatly that he needs to try to get someone to explain to him. A lot of the weird stuff going on. Other weird, interesting thing about this book, it's written in two different languages. First chapter is written in Hebrew. Chapters two through seven, Aramaic, which is like the, the common tongue. It's what most of the people at the time would have spoken. And then the last uh, chapters eight through 12, back to Hebrew. Why? I don't know. 
We'll dig into that later. Um, <laughs> maybe. Uh, Daniel, it's, it's a book that is written to inspire and instill hope in people that feel hopeless and helpless. And I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about Daniel and that story and how that, how that meets that and what that does. But as the great author Dave Pilkey says, before I tell you that story, I need to tell you this story. We're going to do a quick history lesson, OK? Judah was conquered by Babylon. And the temple was destroyed, and the people were taken into captivity. Persia conquers Babylon. The Persians allow the Jews to return home. And they do, and they rebuild Jerusalem, and rebuild the walls, and they rebuild the temple. They rediscover the law. They reestablish all of the practices. Everything kind of gets going again for them. They're still under foreign rule, but they have a degree of autonomy. Then Alexander the Great shows up and conquers literally everything that he can find, uh, including the Persian Empire. Um, and so there's this big Macedonian Empire. Alexander eventually dies. Uh, and after that, the kingdoms, the, the empire is divided up um, because, you know, if you've watched Succession, that's kind of how that's kind of how the children are. Um, the Mesopotamian Babylonian region that area becomes known as the Seleucid Empire. Okay, still Greek, but it's just like a section of it. Okay, so all of that happens. The Jews are, are in Judea, they're in Jerusalem, they're doing their thing. We get to about the year 175 BC, um, and a man named Antiochus IV becomes the king of the Seleucid Empire. And this is an interesting guy, a little bit that I've learned about him. Um, some things to know about him. His rise to power was suspicious. If you go in history, there's no direct proof that he actually was directly involved in any of these things, but he wasn't supposed to be king. Nobody thought that this guy was going to become king of the empire. Um, was not in line, you know, it was a hereditary thing. He was not next in line to the throne. Uh, his father was the king, but he had an older brother. And his older brother had two sons. And so Antiochus was out of the picture. But the older brother was assassinated. And then his eldest son was, um, was held as a hostage in Rome. And the other son, who was an infant, died under suspicious circumstances. And we get King Antiochus IV. Um, so I don't know what's going on there, but it seems like there might be something, something going on. He was known to be very extravagant. He liked the fine life. He threw his money around. He had the finest foods and the finest everything. He, he really, really loved being king. It was fun. Um, he was also extremely arrogant. He called himself Theos Epiphanes, which means God manifest. I don't know that he was as loved as he thought he was or wanted to be, because behind his back, other people called him Epimenes, which sounds like the same word, but it means mad. He knew how to use money to get power. And he knew how to use that power to get him more money. In other words, he was very shady. He was the master of the backroom deal and would, would could work these machinations to get what he needed. In Jerusalem, the religious leaders cozied up to the guy. So you have this case where um, the guy named Jason, who is the brother of the high priest, he's like, I'm going to bribe Antiochus. 
and get him to instill me as the high priest so that I could be in charge. And so he goes about doing this, and it almost worked. He almost got away with it. And the only reason he didn't get away with it is because this other guy, um, where's the name? Menelius, who worked for Jason, went around his back to Antiochus and bid more money and outbid him. And he got made the high priest. And as part of this cozying up and this payments to be the high priest, and now there's kind of like this, this direct connection between the Greek empire and the prominent religion of the day, the religious practices adjust themselves to be a little bit more favorable to the Greek rule um, and to the Greek culture. Um, and so you begin to see in Jerusalem temples built to Greek gods. Um, you see bigger than the temple to the Lord. The sacrifice to the Lord stops. They don't read from the law anymore. Um, in fact, later on, as things get more hostile towards the Jews, any copies of the law that are found are destroyed, um, and the customs are forbidden. So I want you to stop for a second now and imagine what it must have been like to be a devout Jew living in Jerusalem at this time. You've just got to be sitting there wondering, what has happened to my country? Like, it's bad enough that we were under foreign rule, but, but now, like, it's, the, it's fully invaded here. And the leaders, the, the high priest of the priesthood, they're corrupt. They're selling us out. They're, they're, they're leading our people astray. They're telling us things that the government wants them to tell us. They're telling us things that, that, that Antiochus wants us to know, <laughs> not what I think God would do. Who do you turn to? Who can you trust? What do you do? Where is God in all of this? Why is God allowing any of this to happen? Daniel is a book that's written specifically to these people. This is the, this is the context where this book, in all of its zaniness, was assembled and was read. It was to give some sense of hope to these people, and not like the empty platitude hope of, it's all going to be fine, or God's going to make it right someday, it's okay. Not that. <laughs> Real hope, some inspiration that the choices that they make, what they did then, actually mattered, could actually make a difference. So in this, in this time period, in, in, in Jerusalem, there's, you could kind of take the, the devout and divide them into two big categories. Like all broad general, generalizations, it's unfair, but I'm doing it anyway. You've got the Hasidim, and the Maskilim. Now, Hasidim, think like the zealots. These are the rebels. These are the ones that are out there protesting. These are the ones that are calling their congressmen. These are the ones that are screaming. These are the ones that maybe they're doing some terrorist activities. They're zealots. They're fighting back. Um, historically, we know uh, there was the rebellion of the Maccabees, um, where they raised up an army and they fought back the Greeks and kind of won for a little bit. Um, so that's one group, the take a stand, fight back, we're going to do this. The other group, masculine, the word masculine, um, it's, it's actually, it appears a lot through the Old Testament and it's, it's often translated as wise or versed or one who seeks God. These are your teachers, your wise people, your prophets. Um, think Samuel, think Elijah. Um, these people have no power of their own. Whatever power or success they do have, they freely admit that it comes directly from the will of God. The book of Daniel takes 
centers the masculine and their story. It doesn't necessarily take a position and say one is right and one is wrong. It doesn't condemn the Hasidim. It doesn't praise them or anything like that. Uh, it just doesn't tell that story. It tells the story of the wise. The first half of Daniel, like I said, is a collection of stories about Daniel and his friends, right? They are described in chapter one as good-looking young men without defects, which is a weird thing to say about a person, but skilled in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, conversant with learning, capable of serving in the king's palace. These are the masculine. These are the wise. These are the teachers. Um, and in these stories, they show the continued faithfulness of Daniel and friends in the face of many trials. Now, I, another thing to note, these guys worked for the king. They weren't fighting the powers. They were, they were there working within. And yet we have these pretty incredible stories um, where they, they face these trials. And every time they stand firm and every time in these stories they are rewarded for their faith, even though they don't assume that they will be rewarded for their faith. Chapter three is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And this phrase, this, this one always sticks out to me. They're talking to the king and they say, if our God, the one we serve, is able to rescue us from the furnace of flaming fire and from your power, your majesty, so polite, then let him rescue us. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't, Know this for certain, your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. So it's not, we're gonna stand firm because we know God's not gonna let anything happen to us. It's, we're gonna stand firm because we follow God and this is what we do and he could save us and he might save us. And even if he doesn't, we're going to be faithful. Okay, caution, warning. We, as we start this series and go through the first half of the book, we need to be very, very careful when we read these stories in the first half of Daniel. Because when you look at them, it sounds like somebody wants to observe their particular religious practice and the law and culture say you can't do your religious practice and they do it anyway to defy the law and the culture and they stand firm and they're rewarded and then their religious practice gets to be everybody's religious practice. Um, this can sound like a rallying cry to the modern um, complaint of religious persecution that you hear from the leaders of the most powerful religion in this country. This isn't about taking a stand and saying Merry Christmas to people. This isn't about taking a stand and not baking a wedding cake for somebody or I, I don't know, whatever. It's not any of that, um, and, but it's easy to fall into that trap. But it's not about specific religious practices or beliefs, right? We're talking about worshiping God. What pleases God? I want to remind you of Isaiah chapter one where God is talking about all of the religious practices of his people. And he says, what should I think about all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I'm fed up entirely with burned offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I don't want the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from you, this trampling of my temple courts? Stop bringing worthless offerings. Your incense repulses me. New moon, Sabbath, the calling of an assembly, I can't stand wickedness with celebration. I hate your new moons and your festivals. They become a burden that I'm tired of bearing. When you extend your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even when you pray for a long time, I won't listen. Your hands are stained with blood. Wash, be clean. Remove your ugly deeds from my sight. Put an end to such evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. This is not a rallying cry for Christians to feel disgruntled about their society. This is a rallying cry for us to stand up for the people that God calls us to. Any other concerns about how to read the first six chapters of Daniel, I refer you to the 2018 message titled, 
a white people's guide to Bible reading. Second half of the book is a series of visions that Daniel received. Watch out for the beasts. You're going to get some beasts. <laughs> They're weird visions. They're supposed to be weird. Um, it's a different way of trying to tell a story. It's how you tell a story when nothing in your world makes sense anymore. When the powers of this world seem so big, so overwhelming, so grotesque, are they not beasts? But there's also a message of hope in the weird beast visions. This one from chapter 7 that I read earlier, Daniel says, I kept watching. I watched from the moment the horn started bragging until the beast was killed and its body was destroyed, handed over to be burned with fire. Then the authority of the remaining beasts was brought to an end. But they were given an extension among the living for a set time and season. As I continued to watch this night vision of mine, I suddenly saw one like a human being coming with the heavenly clouds. He came to the ancient one and was presented before him. Rule, glory, and kingship were given to him. All peoples, nations, and languages will serve him. His rule is an everlasting one. It will never pass away. His kingship is indestructible. So the beasts are here, but for a limited time. And then one, like a human being, you might say like a son of man, comes. And that rule is everlasting. And that kingdom is indestructible. That's good news. But what does that say? to us now, to the people in the context, in the situation, the people that are trying to be wise. What hope is there for them? Well, chapter 11 has this to say about the wise. The people's teachers will help many understand, but for a time they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder. When they fall, they will receive a little help, but many will join them with deceitful plans. Some of the teachers, too, will fall in order that they might be refined, purified, and cleansed until an end time, because it is still not yet the set time. So the teachers will help many, but they're still going to suffer. Chapter 12, verse 3, a little bit more hope. Those skilled in wisdom will shine like the sky. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and always. A glimmer of hope in a world full of grotesque beasts. The idea that you can shine through and help and make some bit of a difference. I've talked for a long time now, so I'm going to stop. How do you respond to this? What is, what is, what, what's, what's popping into your head as we're, as we're talking through this stuff? What are you hearing this morning?
I'm not sure I've ever read Daniel all the way through, but uh, it'll be interesting to read it in the context that you're presenting today, in the context we're living in, I think. That's exciting. Or not exciting, but hope, hopeful, <laughs> hopeful maybe. Uh, yeah. Or supportive, <laughs> therapeutic, I'm not sure. But uh, it'll be interesting to read it in that way. Yeah, I was kind of thinking similar thoughts. I enjoyed, I always enjoy hearing the historical backdrop um, where different books of the Bible were written, the sort of context that they were living in. Um, I, I find that very interesting in kind of understanding and picturing what it was like when it says, you know, someone was a member of this group or that. And we sort of just, or at least I do, oftentimes gloss over those words. I find myself when I read, I just, if it's a weird word that I don't understand, I just sort of like skip it and get to the next thing and keep going. But so many times, you know, they're obviously they're including that word for a reason. And, and maybe your understanding of a passage or a verse actually turns or would have turned for the contemporary reader of that time you know, on, on what that word was. So that was uh, an interesting tie-in, even understanding the background of the political situation. Um, I thought it was really interesting that Daniel's written in two different languages. I was not aware of that. Um, and so seeing, I had always heard or heard people describe Daniel as a political book. Mm -hmm. um, and so to understand a little bit more of the background and then, as Patrick was saying, the connections between the chaos and the corruption and uh, just seemingly like, how do you even make sense of this broken governance and mass population, you know, then it's like a lot of how I feel right now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to understand that some of this is describing probably, unfortunately, our human condition and human nature and how we wrestle with that and how we find God in the middle of that. And that was true thousands of years ago as it's true today. Uh, when you first read the story about the beast, I was like, um, I think that Daniel might have been taking some mushrooms. <laughs> especially like the horn coming out and it has eyes now. Uh -huh. and so that's a little, I'm curious to see how that, what that kind of comes up with that. But just similar to what, um, <laughs> what Miles was saying about the correlation with like so much of that, that space and, um, you know, that culture that they were living in and trying to, um, uh, and just, yeah, <laughs> now we do not, we seem to repeat ourselves. We do <laughs> not seem to get much better. <laughs> yeah. I know. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what Daniel's visions would be like if he were a contemporary today. What, what would the beasts, what would the beasts be? What would they look like? How would that all play out? <laughs> I'm thinking of Godzilla covered in eyeballs. <laughs> These things are so. Yeah. Oh goodness. All right. Thank you. I I'm I'm excited about this. Um, I, I I am. I'm I'm I love digging into this stuff. I love demystifying some of the weird things um, and uh, but yeah that's that's kind of the thing I'm latching onto right now is that sometimes words can fail us when we're trying to express big concepts whether they're big feelings or overwhelming feelings or big things out there and those are the beasts and um, in the middle of all the beasts there are faithful people doing things that make a difference and eventually the beasts go away. Let's pray. God, thank you for this weird book, for the stories that are familiar, for the visions that are not. Thank you. Thank you for for Daniel that admits that 
they also trouble and disturb him in the midst of it. Thank you for being here with us, for helping us when things seem so out of control, so overwhelming, so many things that we seemingly can't do anything about. Open our eyes to see what we can do. Open our eyes to see the impact that we can have. Help us to find our place in this story, our place in the work, in this kingdom. Inspire us, cultivate in us something new. And also, Lord, come quickly. <laughs>